The next day she certainly was not better. Their party was now farther reduced, for Mr. Palmer was persuaded to perform his promise of following his wife, and while preparing to go, Colonel Brandon himself, with a much greater exertion, began to talk of going likewise. Here, however, the kindness of Mrs. Jennings interposed most acceptably, telling him at once that his stay at Cleveland was necessary. Marianne was, of course, kept in ignorance of all these arrangements. Two days passed away from the time of Mr. Palmer's departure, and her situation continued, with little variation, the same. Mr. Harris, who attended her every day, still talked boldly of a speedy recovery, and Miss Dashwood was equally sanguine. But the expectation of the others was by no means so cheerful. Mrs. Jennings had determined very early in the seizure that Marianne would never get over it, and Colonel Brandon was not in a state of mind to resist their influence, and he could not expel from his mind the persuasion that he should see Marianne no more. On the morning of the third day, however, the gloomy anticipations of both were almost done away, for when Mr. Harris arrived, he declared his patient materially better. But the day did not close so auspiciously as it began. Towards the evening, Marianne became ill again, growing more heavy, restless, and uncomfortable than before. Her sister, however still sanguine, saw her with satisfaction sink at last into slumber. Mrs. Jennings, knowing nothing of any change in the patient, went unusually early to bed, and Eleanor remained alone with Marianne. The repose of the latter became more and more disturbed. Marianne, suddenly awakened by some accidental noise in the house, started hastily up, and with feverish wildness cried out, Is... is Mamma coming? Not yet, replied the other, concealing her terror. But she will be here. It is a great way, you know, from hence to Barton. But she must not go round by London, cried Marianne in the same hurried manner. I, I shall never see her if she goes by London. Eleanor perceived with alarm that she was not quite herself, and while attempting to soothe her, eagerly felt her pulse. It was lower and quicker than ever. Her alarm increased so rapidly as to determine her on sending instantly for Mr. Harris and dispatching a messenger to Barton for her mother. To consult with Colonel Brandon on the best means of affecting the latter was a thought which immediately followed the resolution of its performance. It was no time for hesitation. He offered himself as the messenger who should fetch Mrs. Dashwood. Eleanor thanked him with brief though fervent gratitude and while he went to hurry off his servant with a message to Mr. Harris and an order for post-horses directly, she wrote a few lines to her mother. The horses arrived even before they were expected, and Colonel Brandon only pressing her hand with a look of solemnity and a few words spoken too low to reach her ear, hurried into the carriage. It was then about twelve o'clock, and she returned to her sister's apartment to wait for the arrival of the apothecary and to watch by her for the rest of the night. It was a night of almost equal suffering to both. Hour after hour passed away in sleepless pain and delirium on Marianne's side, and in the most cruel anxiety on Eleanor's, before Mr. Harris appeared. His opinion, however, though acknowledging a very unexpected and unpleasant alteration in his patient, would not allow the danger to be material, and talked of the relief which a fresh mode of treatment must procure, he promised to call again in the course of three or four hours. With strong concern did Mrs. Jennings hear in the morning of what had passed. Her former apprehensions now left her no doubt of the event, and though trying to speak comfort to Eleanor, her conviction of her sister's danger would not allow her to offer the comfort of hope. Her heart was really grieved. Mr. Harris was punctual in his second visit, but he came to be disappointed. His medicines had failed, the fever was unabated, and Marianne remained in a heavy stupor. But he had still something more to try, of whose success he was almost as confident as the last, and his visit concluded with encouraging assurances. About noon, Eleanor began to fancy, to hope, she could perceive a slight amendment in her sister's pulse. She waited, watched, and examined it again and again, and at last ventured to communicate her hopes. Half an hour passed away, and the favourable symptom yet blessed her. 
Marianne was in every respect materially better, and Mrs Jennings admitted with unfeigned joy the probability of an entire recovery. Eleanor continued by the side of her sister with a little intermission the whole afternoon. The time was now drawing on, when Colonel Brandon might be expected back. At seven o'clock, leaving Marianne sweetly asleep, she joined Mrs Jennings in the drawing-room to tea. The wind roared around the house, and the rain beat against the windows, but Eleanor, all happiness within, regarded it not. Marianne slept through every blast, and the travellers, they had a rich reward in store for every present inconvenience. The clock struck eight. Eleanor heard a carriage driving up to the house, and in spite of the almost impossibility of their being already come, she opened a window shutter to be satisfied of the truth. She instantly saw that her ears had not deceived her. The flaring lamps of a carriage were immediately in view. Never in her life had Eleanor found it so difficult to be calm as at that moment. Staying only till she could leave Mrs Jennings maid with her sister, she hurried downstairs. The bustle in the vestibule as she passed along an inner lobby assured her that they were already in the house. She rushed forwards towards the drawing-room. She entered it and saw... Only Willoughby.